Was that the picture of 2041 that we just saw? <clears throat> actually, no. This is today. This is actually happening as we speak in the world. So what should 2041 look like? Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and evening to you, depending on where you're located in the world. This is Anir Choudhury, Policy Advisor of A2I. I'll be your host and moderator for today's discussion. As we all know, the world will change in more fundamental ways and more rapidly in the next 20 years between 2021 and 2041 than it did in the last 13 years between 2009 and 2021. 2009 was the year that we started our digital Bangladesh journey, and 2021 is our culmination point. Futurists predict that humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in all of human history. Let us now get back to today. Uh, <clears throat> the session, we have uh, panelists, distinguished panelists today. Mr. Zunaid Ahmed Pollock, MP, Honorable State Minister, Information and Communication Technology Division, Government of Bangladesh. Thank you. Sir Jeff Mulgan, CBE, Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation, University College London. Ms. Hello to you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jeff, for joining us online. <coughs> uh, Ms. Mylin Fang, who's the chair and co-founder of People Centered Internet with uh, the father of the internet, Vint Cerf. Uh, Professor Ruhul Abid, who's on stage today, who's the president and founder of Health and Education for All, Haifa, Bangladesh, and an associate professor at Brown University Alpert Medical School in the US. <laughs> and we have Ms. Rudmila Naushin, also on stage today, founder and CEO of Config VR and Config Arbot. May I request Mr. Junaid Ahmed Pollock, MP, to kick off today's discussion, enlightening us how we have traveled the digital Bangladesh journey in the last 13 years. The floor is yours, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Anit Chaudhary, for inviting me to talk about this excellent topic, imagining Bangladesh in 2041. So before starting my um, opening remarks, I would like to pay my homage to the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who dreamt about the Shonar Bangla, the Golden Bengal vision, and who gave us freedom, and who actually laid down the foundations of today's modern Bangladesh. And also, I would like to pay my deep respect to the martyrs who dedicated their lives in the Liberation War in uh, 1971. So in 2008, 12th of December, Honorable Prime Minister, visionary leader Sheikh Hasina declared her vision to make Bangladesh a digital Bangladesh by 2021. So now, in 2021, we are realizing how we have been able to develop all of our digital infrastructures, how we have developed our human resources, introduced our digital services online, and also developed our ICT industry. So before actually dreaming and imagining about the 2041, we have to realize that how we have came through a long journey in the last 12 years. So let me share uh, some of the statistics and the um, picture in the digital uh, map, like in, uh, in development of human resources, honorable ICT advisor, the main architect of Digital Bangladesh, Mr. Shajib was a joy, who is guiding us to develop all of these pillars in the last 12 years. Under his proper guidance and supervision, we have been able to uh, introduce ICT as a mandatory subject from uh, uh, grade 6 to 12, and we have been able to establish 13,000 Sheikh Russell Digital Computer Labs, and the result is now we currently we have more than 600,000 IT individual freelancers who are earning more than $750 million uh, per annum. And also we have 300,000 software engineers and service providers who are working in BPO and software uh, areas. And we are exporting $1.3 billion uh, each year. So 
all this achievement have been uh, possible under the proper uh, guidance of Honorable ICT Advisor and the prudent leadership of Sheikh Hasina. So now we, not, we are stopping here. We have a target to make Bangladesh a knowledge-based economy by 2041. Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, a day before yesterday, she uh, declared that after Digital Bangladesh, we have a target to make Bangladesh uh, innovative Bangladesh. So achieving uh, knowledge-based economy and to make Bangladesh a smart Bangladesh, innovative nation, so we have a specific targets to achieve. Like by 2025, Honorable ICT Advisor, Mr. Shajib was a joy. Uh, he already declared and promised to reach $5 billion ICT export by 2025, and we'll be able to uh, provide 3 million jobs in IT, IT sector, and definitely 100% of our government services will be provided through technology and through uh, internet to the citizens, and 100% people will be connected in internet. But currently, we have 130 million internet subscribers, and more than 2,000 services are digitized and through the union digital centers, municipality digital centers, city corporation digital centers, we are providing 10 million services to the people each and every month. So these are the uh, achievements in the last 12 years, and we have some targets to achieve in next five years, 10 years, and 20 years time. So we are quite confident that we will be reaching and uh, achieving all of our targets by 2041. So to make Bangladesh a smart Bangladesh, to make innovative nation, and to make to develop a knowledge-based economy. So let me conclude my opening remarks by mentioning one of my favorite quotations by Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She said that if you want to go fast and far, innovate together. So with this, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, concluding my remarks, and definitely I'm here to hear and learn from the very knowledgeable panelists uh, so that we can work together to make Bangladesh uh, innovative Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Um, <clears throat> so that 2041 is a very important year for us, yes. the next 20 years to become a developed country, a high-income country. Yes. But what does that mean for us? What, what does the work world look like? Let me just take you through a few scenarios so that we can start reflecting on it. So as far as poverty is concerned, <clears throat> we will actually not have any poverty, certainly no hardcore by extreme poverty in 2041. Is this working? In terms of jobs, which uh, Jeff actually will talk about, and he was here last year uh, giving us some guidance on what the future of jobs and future of work will look like. So job categories, new job categories will be created, and he'll talk more about it. Rise of gig economy, nine to five will actually cease to exist. There is no nine to five at that time. And important automation will actually destroy a lot of jobs, but at the same time, it will create a lot of new opportunities. So is it destruction or creation that automation will give us, we'll discuss. In terms of trade and payments, there is no boundary whatsoever. So local producers will have the entire globe as their market, but at the same time, they'll actually compete with everybody in the globe. So there is no local market. In terms of education, that will be completely redefined. The teacher-student, we saw during pandemic mm -hmm. that education actually came through many different media. Mm -hmm. It came through TV. It mm -hmm. came through social media. It came through parents also, in many cases. So the whole education paradigm will be completely changed, and the personalized education that we've been talking about for decades will actually happen. <clears throat> in terms of farming and agriculture, the data will actually come not from people's heads, but from the microsensors, the internet of things, trillions of them in the fields, and satellites. Food production will be much higher, and we'll actually be able to print food. It says that in, by 2025, 10% of New York restaurants will actually serve food that is printed from machines. So what will happen to the cattle and the chickens? 
healthcare. And Professor Rahul Abid will talk about healthcare. So it's already being dominated by AI in developed countries. Uh, robotic surgery is almost uh, more precise already. So what will happen in 20 years? Cars will not be in 2D anymore. We'll actually have 3D traffic because cars will actually fly off the road and they will, we're already seeing prototypes of flying cars. And obviously self-driving cars we are already seeing on the roads. So artificial intelligence will manage traffic, not people. The new social contract, the contract between the government and uh, the people will actually change. We're already seeing uh, people are able to vote on specific policy decisions directly. And in 20 years, this will happen more and more. So the representative democracy will actually shift towards more direct democracy. In terms of service delivery, which is what we work on uh, from A2I quite a bit, uh, the government-citizen relationship will be redefined, and government will actually become completely invisible. Even though they will provide services, the services will be available at the fingertips of people. Whether devices will look like this, we don't know. This is a concept presentation. Mm. So the devices may actually, may not exist in, mm. in phys physical reality. The devices may actually be implanted. We don't know. <coughs> Maybe wearable. Maybe wearable, absolutely. Mm. That's already happening. Mm. In terms of asset management, so land records, certificates, many other things will actually disappear from paper form and uh, Things like blockchain will actually take over in terms of how assets are managed, and potentially corruption will become almost zero. By 2045, many futurists are saying that we'll reach the point of technological singularity, which means a computer will be more intelligent than a human being. And Rudmila, obviously, as she works on robotics, will tell us what that means for us, whether we become servants to the robots or what happens? So she'll tell us that. And then the interesting what? thing, the billionaire space competition that's happening, it's already we're going to space commercially. So in 20 years, we'll actually have land and homes in other planets potentially. And whether we'll be able to plant our flag <laughs> on Mars or any other planet, we'll see. So those are the things that will happen in 20 years. Let me go to the panelists. So I just wanted to implant a few thoughts and provocations. I know that Mylin, you have to run uh, soon for another meeting, so we'll, we'll go to you first. Um, <clears throat> so Mylin is the chair and co-founder of People Centered Internet, chair of Impact Network, and IEEE IC Social Impact Measurement. Her vision for People Centered Internet is to ensure that all people can have access to the opportunities that are made possible when people are connected. She specializes in working with people in communities to form learning networks, to visualize and voice and take action to make their dreams come true. Mylin, can we see you? I mean, can we have her on screen? In 2015, Hello, you joined the father of the internet, Vint Cerf, and co-founded People Centered Internet, which maintains a global network of positive change agents committed to ensuring that technology is developed with a people-centered focus, increasing access while ensuring equality, protecting the vulnerable, and prioritizing human well-being. Please tell us what we need to do to ensure that there is no digital divide in 2041. We hear Thank this term you. all the time. Mylin, please. OK. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I want to say that I was also one of the pioneers of CRM customer relationship management. And I think that the important uh, pioneering that Bangladesh is doing is a lesson for the world. And I want to see more of this. So here's where it could lead in 2041. When I go back to my homeland, Singapore, Singapore in 1965, which is more than 20 years ago, mm. um, really was a poor country. But it, it, it imagined a future for itself. And I see that happening in Bangladesh. I was so impressed in 2019 when I first heard about digital Bangladesh. But I want to say the digital divide is the biggest divide. And how can we overcome it? I'd like to remind you of the initial spread of the internet. It was fueled by the friendship the hopes and dreams of young 
graduate students. The internet was made possible because people dreamed of a future that they wanted to see. I think that the idea of community living learning labs is what Bangladesh can pioneer. One of the most impressive things is the feedback loops that you're doing with civil servants and with feedback from people across the digital divide. I foresee community living learning labs in Bangladesh, which is showing the future, not just of how to live, but how to work, how to produce, how to innovate, so that everyone can be engaged in collective and inclusive pioneering for a people-centered Bangladesh in 2041. We've seen how a country like Estonia really turned to digital to change the possibility for its people. And we've seen what's happened. I've talked about Singapore. Singapore has also seized digital as a way to move ahead. Now, what is the special source of Bangladesh? It is your ability to incorporate feedback. And everyone needs this feedback, but uh, it is not just getting the feedback, it's what you do with the feedback. And Douglas Engelbart, who I worked with, he, he and Vince Surf on the first two nodes of the internet, the first link was between Douglas Engelbart at SRI, Vince Surf and um, Len Kleinrock at UCLA, and they imagined how networks of communities could share and learn from each other. So the future that I foresee for Bangladesh is showing the world how different local communities are themselves learning to be more inclusive, learning to cross the digital divide. But for those breakthroughs happen, maybe two out of a hundred communities are able to do a breakthrough in education or in health or in new ways of production, new ways of trade and commerce with the world. Those two can share and learn with the other 100 that are all networked together. We have to be informed by the full skills repertoire of all people. And those aren't just the skills that we formally recognize today. I remember reading about a young boy in South Asia who began filming his grandmother cooking traditional dishes. And that became a phenomena on the internet because so many people wanted to learn that way of cooking. These are the skills that are out there not recognized by the formal world, but of interest to people around the world. The future we want must be fueled by love and friendship. That way is the best way to cross the digital divide. The open source development and the intense attention to feedback will make Bangladesh, the game changer for our digital future, so that all people can connect to thrive. Back to you, Anya. Marlene, thank you very much. <clears throat> May I move to uh, Sir Jeff Mulgan. Before he became knighted, I used to call him Jeff, now I have to call him Sir Jeff. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we're good friends, so hopefully I'll call him Jeff today. Uh, so, Sir Jeff Mulgan is the Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation, University College London. Previously, he held the position of CEO of NESTA, UK government's innovation agency for nine years. He advised many governments and pioneered many ideas used by governments and others, including creative economy strategies, joined up government, anticipatory regulation, experimentalism, open innovation and problem solving methods. <clears throat> Jeff, uh, a report produced in 2018 by the Institute for the Future and a panel of 20 technologists, business and academic experts from around the world stated that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 
had not even been invented yet. This was 2018. So that was a shocking thing to say, right? And then extrapolate that to 2041. So will there be no professors at that time? So you will cease to exist. Uh, ministers will cease to exist. Policymakers, doctors, entrepreneurs, where do we go? So you came to Bangladesh at a time. You came just before the pandemic. I think you just left before the pandemic hit us, I remember mm -hmm. spending several days with you here. And one of the things that we focused on at that time was the future of work. What will work look like? What will jobs look like? You talked about compasses versus maps at that time. I remember you talked to the education minister, honorable education minister, and large number of entrepreneurs. Uh, so how do we build a crystal ball? And, and, and also, Mylin talked about something very, inter in, very interesting. The community of living learning labs. So you, are the, you talk about uh, learning all the time. So how do we so talk about how we build a crystal ball for the future. How do we reskill, uh, upskill ourselves to keep ourselves relevant so that the robots don't take over? Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy, and it's a, it's a great honor to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, I'm one of so many people who've been hugely impressed, not only by what Bangladesh has achieved as a nation in the last 50 years, but the specific focus on digital technologies and the, the energy to really get ahead of the curve on digital. As Malin said, it's now it's 30 years since the World Wide Web was invented, 50 years since the internet, 70 years since digital. All of these are you know, a long rolling story, which has transformed every part of our, our life and will continue to do so, uh, with jobs in factories, in driving, in retail, in agriculture, all set to be transformed. Just today in the UK, new data came from the government showing that TV dramas employ more people now than coal and gas. A hundred years ago, a million people worked in coal mining, and now there are more people working making Netflix series. An extraordinary change. Uh, and as you hinted, we've seen continuing changes with the rise of the gig economy, many more young people wanting to do business startups, as, as well as traditional full-time roles. Now, I think the quote you started with is a slight exaggeration, because in 2041, I would predict there still will be many of the jobs we know today. There will be farmers, shopkeepers, lawyers, doctors, police, builders, perhaps even professors. But what will change is that every job will increasingly need to use technology to manage the work, to deliver, to engage with customers, and so on. And we've seen, again, as you mentioned, an extraordinary revolution in the last 18 months. As all over the world, every school system had to go online at extreme speed uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic and had to learn new skills. It wasn't that the teachers were replaced, but the job of the teacher changes when learning is online. And new stars emerged as some teachers turned out to be brilliant on YouTube at making classes which lots of children wanted to see. So the challenge, and this is what we were talking about when I was last in Dhaka, is how can the whole country get ahead of the curve of these changes? How to better predict which jobs might grow or might shrink, which skills might be in greater demand or in lesser demand, and to start now with training, adaptation, adjusting what colleges are teaching, helping employers to reskill their workers, uh, ensuring money is going to future skills, and working with parents and students as well. So what they're doing now is future proof and actually ready for the sort of world you've talked about, a world where synthetic biology is a huge sector, where manufacturing is grown, perhaps not made, where every vehicle automatically is talking to other vehicles using uh, data. And there are so many other aspects of this. We can't be certain what will happen in 20 years' time, but we can have a good guess at the direction of travel. And I think what this boils down to, and this is perhaps something Bangladesh has been doing anyway for the last few decades, is realizing the most important capability of any nation this century 
is the ability to mobilize the intelligence of its people. Natural resources don't matter so much. The most valuable companies on the planet are not oil companies. They're not banks. They are companies built on data and know-how. And I think the same is true for a country. It has to tap the latent potential, the ingenuity, the, the drive, the ambition of people at every level, combine those with the best of technology and hardware and data and AI. And that matters for education. It matters for democracy, a democracy which makes the full use of collective intelligence. And I think any country which can do that probably has a rather good future ahead for it. Jeff, thank you very much for your remarks. So the collective intelligence, I think we need to understand that. So when we see Star Trek, we see the Borg, right? So that is collective intelligence. They're all connected together as one organism. So how do we do that? Hopefully we'll hear more from you. Uh, Rudmila, <coughs> so you build, uh, you build collective intelligence, robots that talk to each other. You're the first female entrepreneur in Silicon Valley to establish robotics and virtual reality companies, from what we know. Uh, you started Config VR, which is an AR VR company, and then you started your second venture, Config Rbot, recently. Uh, as a tech entrepreneur recently, you also have been featured in the top 100 US Business Leaders magazine. So congratulations for that. Thank you so much, Mayor. So augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, robots, I mean, all these terms that we don't probably fully understand. So tell us how they're being used so that we don't become robots ourselves or get eradicated. So what is your plan? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really honored to be among such distinguished guests, especially Mr. Pollock. He has been heading our country in the right direction. And um, I thought we'll actually start with the presentation first so that we just get a brief idea. And then I'll go on to my answers. We are mining one that we spoke about. So I'll briefly go over what AR, VR, and mixed reality is because I'm very familiar with the field, but I hope, I think my audience would not, not, not might know the differences. So the fundamental difference between the VR users is VR have an entirely virtual experience, where for augmented reality, we place virtual elements on real world space. And mixed reality is a combination of augmented reality and virtual reality. So Mixed reality users can actually interact with these uh, virtual elements and w during their real world experiences. Um, we have AR, VR is a very versatile field. There's not even one single industry untouched right now where we haven't actually uh, applied AR and VR. So it can be uh, like involved in day-to-day -day workflow management to production lines to uh, different industries like finance, uh, robotics, uh, healthcare, military, education, any field, it's applicable in uh, mainly architectural spaces. So the market overall by 2030 is going to be over $30 billion, which is like a huge number, and it will actually impact many different industries and future innovations will actually continue in the variables market, like AR optics, VR optics. Nowadays, we are actually building uh, mixed reality health, uh, headsets. One of our biggest challenges as a company is um, the 
prices of the headsets are pretty expensive. Like me, for mixed reality is my favorite one, but for that the HoloLens, the Microsoft HoloLens are costing two thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So mainly schools, institutes that that are very well established and developed can actually afford the headsets for the students. But in personal life, only the affluent and the very uh, fans, like the people who actually has a lot of interest, like enthusiasts, will only invest that much money for VR. Um, so that's another huge field, and um, then now let's come to my Bringing favorite. The cost topic. down is going to be it. Yes. Good. So a lot of big uh, companies, Facebook, Amazon, Google, everyone's working to get the numbers down so that it's more affordable for the uh, even like for people and mass uh, market. So uh, I think the best one, my favorite one, is Oculus. The Facebook with that they came out with the newer models have a lot of added features. And it's a standalone set because for the for these processes we need very high computing powers, and it's not easy to have a heavy laptop with you while you're on VR. So uh, Oculus is a standalone headset, so that's why I really prefer that. Now coming to robotics, my second company is a robotics and um, AI company. I'm an electrical engineer and I did my master's in software engineering. So I always wanted to build something where I can build my imagination. So my tagline for the first company is virtualize your vision. And for robotics, I, my tagline is build the future because I work with automation of robotics. So robots actually helping uh, people in manufacturing, packaging in every factories for a long time. So with the help of robots, businesses actually have higher efficiency and it can ensure the safety of their staff in hazardous areas. Um, now, I sorry, I think I'm getting too loud. Um, AR, VR, and robotics. I call them the three amigos because if we combine all three, it gets much more powerful and it can actually offer a more immersive medium to actually operate the robots with AR and VR. So with the help of uh, low latency networks, people can actually utilize robots remotely using intuitive AR and VR controls, like I was mentioning yesterday. Like sitting at Stanford, my goal is to tie up both my company's services. And with both, we can operate from Stanford University, like we can, uh, doctors can operate on a patient and sitting in Bangladesh. So that's where the world is going. That's where the AI has taken us, the IoT devices has taken us. So um, <clears throat> because all three can be combined together or by itself, all three are very powerful markets. And I think uh, that's where we're headed to. And during the COVID times, I've seen um, necessity is the mother of invention, as Payavas Palabha mentioned that yesterday as well. So we actually created a lot of job opportunities. A lot of people come to me, come to me and say, OK, we are losing jobs. Yes, it's true that repetitive tasks are being replaced by different technologies. But to maintain these technologies, to gather these data, to actually run this system, we need a lot of brains. And and that's where we are creating jobs. In fact, of, in, instead of actually taking away jobs, yes, it's true. Like a lot of physical laborers might not be, um, might not have jobs in the later period, but they will. Their jobs will be replaced by something else. So when there's something, you know, new innovation keeps coming in, people can actually move on and advance more than just being and sitting, getting stuck at one space. Mm. <coughs> Sorry. So I think um, every combined together, we have a lot of uh, space to work on. Mm -hmm. And 2041, we'll see a lot of advancements, not only in Bangladesh, but globally. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Shudmila. One of the things that Jeff talked about is how teachers actually are creating content for new skills. In Bangladesh, we have a teacher's portal where teachers work together to create new types of content. They have not used AR or VR. AR may be a, an area where they can actually start doing things. Uh, we, we have seen during the pandemic that on Facebook, teachers together, thousands of teachers, have created 131,000 hours of content. So many of this, if we can actually, could be done with AR, it could be much more effective potentially. Yeah, Hopefully in future. Yes, we'll, for we'll get kids, your help to yeah, equip the teachers. Yeah, of course. Because for kids, when they get something in like interactive, it actually spikes their interest a lot more than just learning from a 2D. Like if you can make nice, fun cartoons. We actually launched uh, uh, STEM robots, which will actually teach you 
uh, robotics and Python through my company. I did that especially for kids and for the parents. It can be a nice um, evening time where they can spend time with their kids and teach them robotics and Python. And Python is very important. I keep repeating that because Python is one of the backbone software language for AI, robotics, and all any other software that we are using. One of the basic language is Python. So I think people should take a lot more interest in tech fields. In, in different software languages. And if someone's creative, I think they have a huge field for AR because in VR, we can create anything. Like all of four of us can be sitting in Mars now and talking. So that's how immersive and that's the beauty of innovation. Right. So the more adaptive we are and the more uh, skilled we are, I think we will have a better future as a nation. So I really request to all the people in Bangladesh to be, become more adaptive towards robotics, AR, VR and latest technology so that we can take the country forward as our Prime Minister has wished it. Thank you. Thank you, Rudmila. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor Ruhul Abid, let me come to you. Uh, you're the President and Founder of uh, Health and Education for All, Haifa, Bangladesh. Uh, you're also the Associate Professor of Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, my own alma mater also, uh, and an Executive Faculty Member of Brown Global Health Initiative. So you spearheaded numerous community health projects in Bangladesh. In fact, right now you are, you've actually just come from several travel around the country. And uh, in 2020, uh, you and your uh, organization, nonprofit organization, were nominated for Nobel Peace Prize. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Uh, we're very proud of that. <coughs> uh, so one of the things that Haifa does, digital innovations like Nirog, that helps to acquire, analyze, and retrieve medical records of patients uh, with chronic diseases, with unique barcodes for each patient, and the encryption of patient data in handheld tablets. And what we know is that uh, you do secure server which are solar powered so that you can work without internet as well. So we'll hear more about that. But specifically, what we'd like to know about is the elements of your work that can actually help us achieve the universal health coverage, which is our commitment towards the sustainable development goals, the 2030 agenda, uh, and also for other LDCs in developing countries. So what do you see will help us prepare for that goal and how that will take us to 2041 healthcare? Thank, thank you very much <clears throat> for your uh, great questions, actually. So. Uh, the NIROG, the electronic medical record system we have, is actually uh, individualized patient records. It's a portable, so you can take it anywhere. And this is encrypted, as you mentioned. So this uh, NIROG captures the patient's data in real time, and then it can store. And we have a local Wi-Fi router. So if it's like uh, we have uh, performed uh, in many places, like garment factories, uh, we uh, screened 35,000 garment factory workers. And then in Rohingya camp, we have three medical centers in Kutupalong, Balukhali, and Bhashanchor now. Mm -hmm. So there is almost uh, 170,000 patients record. So all these are happening uh, in the absence of electricity, in the absence of internet. So through the Wi-Fi router, we are creating an internet internal connection. And then at some point, those data are being transferred when they are getting the connectivity to the internet, to the server, the encrypted data. So it's updating every day or once a week. And then when the patients are coming back, so you have that barcode which you mentioned. So you can scan that or put that number so they can retrieve the patient's data. So you can follow up chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, malnutrition, antenatal checkup, even mental health we included recently. So in my view, like how I see is a for universal health coverage, it's very important. It's, it's the, we are assuring, so millennial development goal and sustainable development goal is totally different. We did very good in millennial development goal, like achieved tremendous success, actually, in all aspects. Sustainable development goal, the universal health coverage, which is a component of that. So it ensures quality health care to every citizen. So if we want to do that, we definitely need to know every citizen's health status. And that's where this electronic medical record system comes in. But what type of medical record system we need? Like uh, the places I work at Harvard or Brown University, where I am, like if we bring that 
it will not work here because we have to contextualize to Bangladesh. Like all the uh, courses we developed, uh, advanced COVID-19 clinical management certification course with the DG Health and Ministry of Health in collaboration. Now we are doing mental health with the National Institute of Mental Health. We contextualize that. So that contextualization is very much needed that what we have in our Upajala health complexes, in community clinic and district hospitals, and how we can connect that from community clinic, Upajala health complex to district hospital. And this kind of, uh, kind of easy to use uh, software, which is Nero, can be very much helpful to do that because it's a very simple technology. And it, you can take it anywhere, you can access it from anywhere if you have the correct access and you, you have the password and everything, so you can do that. So I think that can be used in community clinic, and Upajala Health Complex can be used as a hub, and there all the screened patients who are uh, diagnosed with a provisional diagnosis, say hypertension or diabetes, because those are provisional, because community clinic doesn't have the doctors. Sure. So Upajala Health Complex has, <coughs> so they, sorry, the initially diagnosed patients can go to the, say, if in one community clinic you have 2,000 patients, you uh, diagnose, say, 250 patients with different chronic diseases. They will go once a year to Upazila Health Complex, get checked there, and from there they will prescribe the medicines and they will take throughout the year, once a week, going to the community clinic, getting the medicine. So that way it can have a very uh, effective uh, healthcare system. And then district hospital will be only for referred cases, more complicated cases. And this system has a ICD-10 coding, everything, and the drug interactions. So this is a very simple technology, but very much usable for Bangladesh. And it's being used, as I speak, like in many parts of Bangladesh. And we are also doing cervical cancer screening with this electronic medical record system, which is totally paperless. So it's not only that, uh, that you are doing paperless, and it's also environmental friendly, because you are saving a lot of trees instead of papers. And you have all the data at your fingertip. So I think that universal health coverage is the electronic medical record system of every citizen is required. And at this point, we are thinking of getting the patients from community clinic to Pajala Health Complex. But if we look at 2041, which is the topic of today's uh, discussion. So uh, 2041, I don't think that patients have to travel to Pajala Health Complex, even if they don't have doctors there. Mm -hmm. Because that data will be transferred. Mm -hmm. And then you can have that wearable devices for the chronic diagnosed cases, and then you can get the data from there. But initially, you have to have that screening system. So 2041, I think uh, a lot of changes will be here. But we have to be ready for that, so that we don't have a Kodak moment. Like a, at, during when we were growing up, it was Kodak everywhere. But they had a hard time to believe that the uh, pictures will be digitalized. right? So, But Bangladesh is like way ahead of that. So we are already thinking it, and we achieved a lot already. So definitely, it will be great. And then I conclude with one thing. Whatever we do mm -hmm. with the healthcare, we have to remember that human health is not only physical. So there will be always, there are questions like whether the jobs will be gone or nurses will be there, paramedics will be there. Because when you are in a patient bed, like when I'm unconscious, maybe you can uh, give the scrub and do the surgery, everything. But when I'm conscious, I need a human touch. And uh, that is very important. And we saw that COVID-19 made a lot of mental patients because it's kind of Zoom meeting, all online. So we have very limited human contact. So the mental health problems are coming up. So whatever we do, we have to have that human touch. And that's very important. Human touch, contact, sports, those are very much essential for our uh, mental health also. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abid. You talked about a number of important things. Uh, and one of the important things is the frugal solutions that work in the context of Bangladesh and possibly other developing countries as well, that we have to develop ourselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody else will do that for us. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, may I move to our Honorable ICT Minister one more time? Uh, just to give you a little bit of background to the audience, uh, you were nominated as the young global leader in 2016 by World Economic Forum. And uh, you became the Minister of State at age 33, making you the youngest minister in the history of Bangladesh. So again, I think inspiration for the young generation, always. Uh, our Honorable Prime Minister yesterday, on the Digital Bangladesh Day, uh, for which we are arranging this, this program today, 
in her speech, inaugural speech, she talked about the major need to invest in the capacity and the leadership of the youth uh, of the country. And Jeff talked about that, Ruth Miller also talked about that. Uh, so what are the initiatives that you're taking uh, and what vision for the future do you have for that? No, thank you, Anirbhai. So you have uh, rightly articulated and mentioned about the recent activities and the progress and what Honorable Prime Minister said yesterday during her speech on the occasion of the National Digital Bangladesh Day. So you are asking about my age when I took my oath as a State Minister for ICT at the age of 33. So now I'm uh, 41. And in 2041, I'll be 61. And uh, so far I know you will be 71. So I actually, old. Uh, <laughs> not old, maybe Dr. Ruhul Abid will invent some medicine. Uh, by using those medicine, we'll be more younger than even uh, we imagine. So I think uh, we have to look into the future generations. And what Honorable Prime Minister, our visionary leader, Sheikh Hasina, uh, mentioned and uh, promised to develop our future generations and to decentralize the, the technology and the uh, creative channels. Honorable Prime Minister guided us to establish schools of the future. So what uh, Dr. Ruhul Abid uh, said about the universal uh, health care system, and we also believe uh, in the learning ecosystem, because the current education system is not actually considered to develop our current generations to prepare them for the 2041. So that is why we believe in uh, new types of learning system. And we have to build this learning ecosystem uh, as soon as possible. And that is why we're going to set up these schools of the future. What Rudmila Appa mentioned about the augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, if we could give uh, our children all these facilities, like robotics lab, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, Internet of Things labs so that they can go to their schools and have their first-hand experience and do some uh, like uh, project work together so that they can practice their active learning process, they can uh, understand about the circular uh, economy and how they uh, respond to the climate change and how they can be more serious and sincere about the environment. So all these things we want to include in our curriculum. And you will be very happy to know that we have a target to uh, develop 2 million uh, coders in primary school in next uh, five years. Because we are going to introduce coding and problem solving skill set in our curriculum in the primary level. And we have already made mandatory ICT subject as a mandatory subject from grade 6 to 12. So in addition of all these initiatives, in the sub-district level, we are going to set up digital service and employment training center so that all the undergraduates, they should not move from their towns, from their villages, to the cities, to the abroad, for only employment. So we are providing the training and incubation facilities to those youth who are sitting and living at their hometowns and who have passed their school, second, school, uh, secondary school certificate exam or higher secondary school uh, certificate exam so that they can have six month certification uh, training programs, 12 months um, uh, diploma courses sitting at their hometown. And after having this uh, training and knowledge, they can employ themselves and they can contribute in our digital economy. So, uh, and also at the district level, we are setting up education, training, and entertainment centers. So in the year of celebration of 50 years of our independence, we have actually taken a very futuristic project. So we want to establish 50 edu trainment center where students and the youth will come and they will learn 
and they will uh, receive the training programs. At the same time, they will enjoy uh, all the education, all the training. So that is why we have named it Edu Trainment Center. Mm -hmm. So because you know that uh, all the time we have a fear uh, to learn, right. but we want to make learning as a joyful uh, uh, topic. So that is why we have named it Edu Trainment Center. And at the same time, we are building 39 high-tech parks and 64 Sheikh Kamal IT training incubation centers at district level. And we have established already Innovation Design and Entrepreneurship Academy to create the entrepreneurial supply chain, to create the innovation ecosystem, and to create the startup culture. So I'm really confident that by 2041, we'll be able to create this digital economy ecosystem. So the, all the transactions uh, will be cashless, and all the office work is already uh, partially uh, paperless. And what Rudmila and Dr. Uh, Ruhul Abid said, that everything should be connected with internet, and high-speed internet we have made available. And just yesterday, the Honorable ICT Advisor rolled out 5G network uh, in Bangladesh. So I'm really confident that we will be leading the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I think that's a very inspirational thing that you just said. We'll be leading the fourth industrial revolution rather than just being part a of user the fourth and the industrial revolution. Follower of that. Yeah. I think very, very inspirational. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just do a very rapid round. Mm -hmm. Just maybe one minute, or maybe one and a half minutes uh, per panelist. So, Jeff, I'd like to start with you. You talk about collective intelligence all the time. What does that look like? And who is who's collective intelligence? I mean, is it the intelligence of the university researchers or the living learning labs that Mylene talked about? So, what does collective intelligence look like? And how will that make us a leader of fourth industrial revolution uh, going forward? So, I mean, I'd really echo what the other speakers said. I think for Bangladesh in the next 20 <coughs> years, the challenge is it, on the one hand, to stay in touch with the frontiers of technology, quantum computing, uh, neuro implants, the next generations of the Internet of Things and so on, while also building up strength and depth. And what the minister said about education seems to me exactly right. This isn't about teaching IT skills to children. It's about them learning by doing, learning by making things, using software, creating robots, and getting some of the fun, the pleasure of active work on digital rather than just traditional uh, classroom pedagogy. And that may need new models of schooling. But just one final point, which I think is crucial for collective intelligence of a whole society. I absolutely agree with the vision of future healthcare, and we lack a lot here in the UK in terms of personalized records, use of data, smart responses to COVID-19 or the future. But I hope by 2041, there'll be as much attention to mental health as to physical health, mm -hmm. to how we reduce anxiety, depression, and so on uh, amongst the public. This has been brought into sharp focus through the pandemic. The digital industries have been, in the last 20 years, more part of the problem than part of the solutions, often you know, increasing anxiety amongst teenagers. But I think in the next 20 years, we will be looking at how to mobilize digital to help people not only be physically healthy, but also mentally healthy, managing themselves, with their family, with their peers, and at the level of a whole society. And I'd hope any country which aspires to be a world leader in 20 years' time will put the people's well-being right at the core, as well as being right on the forefront of technology. Jeff, thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, let me also uh, say my gratitude, because you pointed out a very important thing, the mental health, which is often ignored. And mental health is recognized as a much more critical problem today than perhaps it was 20 years ago. And perhaps going forward 20 years, it will be even a more critical problem. So just focus on that, I think, will be, will be very important. So on that note, let me go to uh, Dr. Ruhul Abid, actually. Uh, in terms of universal health coverage, you talked about that. Now, talk about maybe public-private partnership there. So whose responsibility is it? to establish universal health coverage? And how do we create the right technology? You talked about uh, wearable computing. So who develops that? Should 
the government take initiative to develop these low-cost wearable technologies, or should we depend on the private sector, and the private sector innovations will help us do that? That's very a uh, very critical question. So I think, uh, I, I think it should be the partnership, private and public partnership, because uh, government plays a significant role in any infrastructure development, be that roads, be that internet roads, so any, any kind of thing. So I think that uh, public and private partnership would be very important. So private innovations will be there, so that there will be private competitions, and so government should create that kind of environment so where the private uh, groups or companies or organizations can compete, innovate, and that, that's, that would be the uh, way to progress, actually. So, and then government can guide, because uh, as we progress in 2041, there will be like legal issues and other issues, because lots of data are generated. Ethical issues also. Right? Yeah, so, so there are a lot of data generated. And not only that, like you will have a more technology to have customized uh, living organism. So, so with that in involvement and uh, evolution, we definitely need more government regulations, but with the private partnership. So it should not be only private or only government, because it, there has to be a <coughs> conscience that uh, we govern our, our uh, actions. So, and for development, definitely, private sector did a lot of things, and from the, where uh, my residence is now in the US, so it's a very much private-oriented uh, mm -hmm. system, and the the, and that's uh, where the cost is very high. Right. The cost <laughs> is very high, but the innovation is also a uh, lot of innovations. So we want innovation at a low cost yes. so that we can really have universal health coverage. Otherwise, exactly. it's an exclusionary health coverage, right? Exactly. And that will not be universal if right. we have that. Because when we're talking about wearable devices, mm -hmm. so whether what's the cost of that, whether people's affordability will be there or the cost will be so low that everybody can. So, so there should be government-private partnership definitely to reduce the cost, to re have the proper regulations, uh, to protect people's privacy. So all those, and the, uh, as we discussed, the mental health. Mm -hmm. So if we just let the competitions like run at its own pace, there may be a lot of problems also in future. So there are progress, there, are, there may be some issues. So th that's why we need a partnership. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abid. On the point of partnership, yes. Rudmila, you are from the private sector. And we are very encouraged uh, that you are from Bangladesh and you are making waves in Silicon Valley in technologies that are absolutely the cutting edge, bleeding edge almost. Uh, what is your message to the budding entrepreneurs, as uh, uh, our honorable ICT minister talked about? that we are trying to develop opportunities for them. So what is your message to them so that we can build the low-cost technologies that will make Bangladesh a leader of the developing world? Thank you, Anibriya, for the question. So first, I would like to say uh, what the government is doing, building a lot of training centers for hands-on experience. So this is very important because we need to educate the, educate, uh, educate the whole ecosystem. We need to have more skilled people. And for the skill training, the best way you can actually attract students and be efficient at it is when you have hands-on lab. And what, that's what the government is doing. So through VR, we can actually train a lot of phobias, like height phobia, spider phobia. We can train the brain. Even like for stroke patients, when they need rehabilitation, we can actually Actually, uh, the patients can relearn their activities through VR with assisted healthcare assistant. So when the, f when the world has so much scope, I think all the entre entrepreneurs should actually focus on the global market, not only the local market. And we are actually already in discussion with ICT to actually build our own uh, local uh, headsets for Bangladesh that will actually help us uh, with the affordability of the hardwares. Um, with training, we have a huge way to go. It's a journey that's just beginning. We need a lot of software uh, training. We need all kinds of different multiple tools. Uh, when the Rana incident happened, with, we were actually pr planning to build prosthetics using uh, the 3D printing for like hands and arms using robotics that people can actually afford. 
So there is, there's a huge field, there's a huge opportunity uh, for students in Bangladesh. I will always like to tell them to get on outsourcing websites like uh, Fiverr, Upwork. There are huge opportunities which they can sit from a rural area and get an uh, easy job to get to apply for. Data entry is a huge area again because uh, we need data. Data is our asset. So building the asset for the country, that's the foundation. So we need a lot of data. Anyone can actually upload a picture for like a red car and train the machine, like what we call is a machine learning, uh, the computer that it's a red car. So the more images we collect, the smarter our machine becomes. So the data in that field is, uh, again, like a, a huge uh, opportunity. Content making, um, movies, all kinds of like anyone can just choose their passion and focus on that and attract the global market, not only the lo local market. The reason I'm here for this trip is because uh, I wanted to set up my assembling plant because labor is much more economical compared to the other countries. Right now I'm manufacturing in China, India and Singapore, which I want to transfer to Bangladesh because I want to build our local robots using our local talent and then take it to the US and ship and sell globally. So we will actually create a lot of jobs, but only if we, there need to be a demand and supply chain, like equal uh, demand for it. So we need, we have huge demands for all kinds of software engineers, hardware engineers, content writers, uh, creative developers. So there's a huge field. I would like the, uh, to invite all the entrepreneurs to not only uh, focus on the local market, but actually go on to the global market and be we, as the students, should be well trained to um, be well equipped <coughs> to handle these changes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rudbella. Would like you to guide us on where we should focus from the government. So thank you for that. Uh, Honorable Minister, you will be the last <laughs> to close. Um, you talked about the innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Our Honorable ICT advisor, Shaji Bajaj Joy, talks about innovate, not imitate. Mm -hmm. Always talks about that. Uh, in terms of creation and not just usage, in terms of innovation and not just imitation, uh, and the going on the public-private partnership. So we have uh, private sector on the stage, we have public sector on the stage. What would be the best partnership that you envision? So what should we focus on from the government and what should we ask the private sector to focus on? The first of all, I have already um, explained and uh, I have shared about our recent initiatives we have taken. Many of our institutes we have introduced and established. Many of our development projects uh, has been completed and also we have taken some new projects. So let me um, just focus on three C's like creativity, co-creation and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So we believe in a collaborative approach from the ICT division, Honorable ICT advisor, Mr. Shaji was a joy. He always encouraged us to collaborate with other different ministries, to collaborate with academia and industry. So this is the main strength of us that Honorable Prime Minister also believes that uh, government should not do the business. Government should play as a facilitator's role what Dr. Uh, Ruhul Abid uh, sir mentioned about how America has actually developed their knowledge-based economy in the last 60 years or uh, so more. But in Bangladesh also, if you look just in the last 50 years, we have actually transformed our economy from labor-based to technology-based in last only 12 years. Now we are targeting to develop a knowledge-based economy. So for creating the environment for the innovators and entrepreneurs, and to create the private-public academia partnership, we have developed some of our institutions like Startup Bangladesh Limited Company, which is the government-funded venture capital company. This is the first time in Bangladesh, and hopefully it is uh, one of the uh, rare examples from the world that government has established a venture comp capital company, which is government funded. So initially, we have started with $60 million, and we have a target to make this company as a billion dollar company itself 
by 2041. We have already invested in few companies, like more than uh, 300 companies we have invested. Uh, some of them are now graduated from the uh, early stage to growth stage, and we are really hopeful to have unicorns, at least five unicorns by 2025. Because we have only uh, one unicorn in Bangladesh, Bikash, but there are so, so potential areas in our startup area, so we are really confident that we'll have at least five unicorns by 2025. And currently, these 2,500 startups are doing and progressing very well in our fintech area, in our e-commerce, education, health. These are the potential areas, but at the same time, animation, gaming, AR, VR, these are potential areas. Because first time we have uh, developed one animation full-length movie in Bangladesh, Mujib Amar Pita, you know that, yes. under ICT division. And we have a creative workforce. What I want to say that you all are talking about the robotics, artificial intelligence, all these uh, futuristic technologies are going to replace human beings. That is a great threat. I I'm also uh, agreed about that, but what I believe that what technology and robots cannot do, that is creativity. Right. So that is the area, that is why I'm focusing on creativity, co-creation, and collaboration. And that is why we want to encourage our children uh, to, to learn in a joyful method. That uh, I just want to share one story during this pandemic. I have three sons and uh, they were very much attracted with the mobile games like uh, others. Uh, they were so much uh, spending their time with the smartphones. Then uh, their mother actually uh, decided to, uh, to give them uh, illustrator training. Yeah. And uh, the very young uh, teacher uh, who actually gave them uh, training and online, yeah. and they were actually uh, busy with the illustrator and my uh, my uh, the elder son mm -hmm. he uh, became the freelancer and uh, he is now earning handsome amount of money already a few hundred dollars uh, he has already earned by uh, designing the logos so this is how you should actually uh, teach uh, your children so that they should learn in a joyful manner mm -hmm. so and also we have a target to set up center of excellence on 4IR in 100 universities. Mm -hmm. Let me share uh, one story. Just yesterday, I inaugurated first brain-computer interface lab mm -hmm. in Bangladesh, right. uh, in United International University. Mm -hmm. That was also government funded, because government but is very keen, so but to the, the private university. Exactly. That is the first time. That is why I'm, I'm sharing this story, because that is the first time from the government side, we are funding to the private university to set up a very futuristic uh, lab that is brain-computer interface. And, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that in a in few years, you will have a, like Neuralink of Elon Musk in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about the depression. Uh, 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 Mental health. Yes. So they are also working in these areas. So I think. Uh, this is how we want to create the innovation ecosystem. And also, we have a plan to set up 20 university incubation centers mm -hmm. so that the students who are actually submitting their thesis, their project papers, we want to transform all those ideas into the products. And from ideation to commercialization, we want to create the ecosystem and student to start up and the many other innovators to entrepreneurs programs we have started and collaborating with the universities. And uh, just yesterday, Honorable Prime Minister inaugurated two university business incubation centers, one in Khulna University of Engineering Technology, another is Chittagong University of uh, Engineering and Technology. So these two, Unibator is going to connect and reduce the gap between the industry and academia. So this is how we uh, are working and collaborating to each other. So let me conclude my uh, closing remarks by mentioning uh, one of my favorite quotations by Honorable I seated by Mr. Shajib was a joy. He always said that find your own innovations, find new technologies, do not imitate, innovate. So that is our actually driving force. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Uh, we will conclude.
But maybe I'll just summarize with five points that I've written down from all the discussions. Very rich, engaging, and inspiring discussion that happened today. So focusing on the underserved, I think that's the theme going forward in the 2041, because otherwise the divides will actually increase, as Mylin talked about. So the first is the power of imagination. I think Mylin gave that example of where Douglas Engelbert and uh, Vince Cerf sent an email or a communication over the internet between mm -hmm. each other. So that's the imagination they had, and that created internet, and mm -hmm. look what it has done for us. So the power of imagination. Second is, I think we talk about this, uh, the Honorable Minister and talk about this, that talent is universal, but opportunities are not. I think. That's where we have to work together to give the opportunities to the talented. And exactly. We don't know where the talent will come exactly. from. Exactly. Right. Uh, the third is frugal but very high-tech technologies. So the, the ones that you talked about, it doesn't need internet, it doesn't need power. It's very high-tech, but it's also very frugal. And you've created an ecosystem of patient healthcare in areas where the basics don't even exist, in the, in the, in the camps, the refugee camps and everything. So I think frugal but high tech. Uh, the use of data, a lot of you talked about it. We don't, I, didn't, I don't think we understand what data really means and what revolution it can really cause. So focusing more on data. And the fifth thing is really about the public-private partnership. I mean, we, we use that as a jargon, as a, as a rhetoric, but I think we, you've, give, you've given several examples of mm -hmm. how the government is funding private enterprises and how pi private enterprises are actually creating innovations for the public, for the, for the institutions. So, so I think uh, the last thing I'll conclude with is Bangladesh as a leader in fourth industrial revolution, creation, not just use, innovation, and not just imitation. Uh, yesterday, we ended our journey of digital Bangladesh 13 years, starting from the 12th of December of 20, 2008. Today, we begin the next 20 years of journey towards innovative Bangladesh on this not an unlucky 13th day, <laughs> but a lucky 13th of December 2021. Thanks, everybody.